Amen. Awesome. What was important about the activity? Communication and then teamwork. And, and right at the end, when the strategizing had to take place, everybody had to agree what we're building. There had to be a common agreement. And that is exactly the same when it comes to the mission God has given us. All of us can't be building our own mission. Because God has given the church that you were added to a mission. And the only way we can fulfill it, if we had to ask the question, what has God called this church for, that none of us will answer differently. There is no power in this unity, but there's an immense force in a unit. There's an immense force when, when things work together. If, you, if you're familiar with sports, if you watch rugby, they have this thing they call a mall. A mall is like a unit, eight people pulling together to move eight other people. And there is no way it can take place if all eight is not working together. So if you have played rugby, you would even understand this language. We are talking while you're pulling together because there's a rhythm that has to start taking place. And the moment we can get the rhythm, we become unstoppable. We become unstoppable for the kingdom of God. And so while Pastor Chris was preaching, I had this thought in my mind, which I believe the Spirit was putting on my heart, and it was asking me the question, what would God want on the last day? What would He want it accomplished in the world? So if we know that the world is coming to an end, there's, it, it, it's a danger that if we don't live for eternity, you've got to live beyond this life. There's something bigger. What would God want when the world is end, when the last day of struck, God is fed up and He comes back and He comes to take His people? What would He want? If I read my Bible from Genesis to Revelation, God was always about the redemption of mankind. It was the single most important thing. The, right after Eve, Adam and Eve sinned, Genesis 3, the first prophetic picture of salvation takes place. Imagine it. It's two, three chapters into the, book, the Bible. And, G and God is already saying there's a seed coming. And that seed that is going to crush is going to step on the serpent. One who's coming to conquer. And so on the last day of this world, I would believe God would want as many people as possible at the feast. And we have said it over and over and over in this church that God never commands anybody else but humans to preach the gospel. Nobody else. You don't see it in the Bible that God is asking anybody else to preach the gospel. And then I had a follow-up question. So firstly, I felt, and it's, it's publicly, so it's not superstition, like it's public as day. What, what does God value? God values the human life. I think Proverbs says uh, the man who wins soul is wise. He's wise, someone who gains people for the Lord. Uh, Paul talks about people as your crowns. If you don't want to enter empty-handed into the kingdom, you've got to have some people by your side. I am someone's crown. Someone lured me to the Lord, discipled me. And at the end of the day, he might say, look, God, there's full. And he brought me. And so what God would want then is that who, who of us wants to see a transformed society? Transformed, right? A, a, a society, even where economically everything is transformed. How does that happen? There's only one way. You need to change someone from the inside. Understand? You can, you can work out all, all, all policies can be in favor of equality, but you can never remove the depravity of man without the gospel of Jesus. It's impossible. It, it's literally impossible. So if we want to see economic change, Start discipling more people that are leading businesses so that they govern it in the right way. How do you get greed out of a man? Let him meet the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He's going to understand what's laying down a life to steward wealth for the people. And so when we want to see a transformed society, there's nothing possible without changing someone's heart, 
something you can't do, but you're the way to do it. You're the, the, the what do you call that? You're the, you're the instrument that God uses to reach people. And I like what Pastor Chris says. He has a nine to five. And I know some of you, you know, the moment you're going to mystery, some of you think we stop working. And then you'll, you'll feel like that time when you had a real job. You know, and, and I remember before I came into ministry, I worked, our job was seven to five. You know what I did back then? I still made disciples. It wasn't because of my calling or where I'm at. We all make, even at this moment, um, our household is firm on a Tuesday, a Wednesday, and a Thursday is discipleship day. That's what we do. Jojo on a Tuesday and on a Wednesday, I'm on a Wednesday and a Thursday. That's what we do. What if we have any other plans, we schedule around that. Why? Because we value relationships. We value people. Therefore, we'll put everything aside for that. And my task this evening is to talk to us about how to build a healthy relational discipleship culture. Now, if, I, if, if you had to share with the person next to you, what on earth does it even mean to have a relational discipleship culture? And the problem comes in if we don't define it as a unit, we are building in different directions. So we can't see healthy relationships as leadership. Let me, let me say this first. You, you, you know who we are talking to here, right? This is not the broader church. This is the leadership of the church. So imagine if it doesn't function here, it doesn't function outside of here. Okay, so if we don't get it, nobody gets it. If we don't grasp it, nobody grasps it. So what would you say is a relational discipleship culture? What, what would that look like? Tell the person next to you one sentence. What do you think it means? A relation. What do you think it means to be relational? A relational discipleship culture. So a relational discipleship culture, a culture is things people do without thinking. Okay. So when we say a relational discipleship culture, what we want to do without thinking is follow Jesus. Relationship with God. What we mean when we say relational discipleship culture, we are talking about relationship with those who do not know God. We do that without thinking. Why? I'll tell you later. Thirdly, a relational discipleship culture should have family involved. We should do family without thinking. It is what we do. It is who we are. A culture defines us. A culture says this is what we do without even thinking who we are. And so when we ever we say relational discipleship culture, and there is no healthy relationship, a, a, a healthy relational discipleship culture without these three factors. Why? Because all of them are cultures that God values. God was first and foremost jealous for his own glory. Us to him. God dies for the world, us to the world, and God adds us to family, us to spiritual family. And so the only way we build a healthy relation with the discipleship culture, it starts among us as leaders, and it flows over. And, and I, was, I remember, so we were praying for the cluster, before the cluster, and we were praying, and I, I was, when God was placing him out, and we say it so many times, it almost becomes like a, a mundane thing, but we were saying, but God was reminding me just leaders should not get involved in complaining. Because the moment you do, the moment you come to a place where you get involved with gossip and complaining, you are um, um, you're like a rotten apple. You, you, you affect everybody. And so if leadership goes to the bigger church and complains to someone who's not, it's like you are already affecting them. And so we should have a good and a healthy heart on our side. And so I want to break tonight's session up in two uh, portions. One, what breaks a relational discipleship culture? What works against it? Because I can make you aware of what you should be doing, but I also want to help you what are the things you shouldn't be doing. 
Because it's working against, as a leader, it's working against what we are doing. And then secondly, we would look at what builds a relationship culture. What contributes? What, what helps? Just stay there. You can stay at the first one. What, what helps? And like I said earlier, we, we have to understand, I'm not talking to the bigger church. I don't know if you, if you hear the language normally when you speak to these, it's a bit different. We come with a lot more compassion and, and slowness. You know, when you're in church, we, we understand. But right up here, God has called us to something bigger, and we've got to run with it. We carry responsibility. When you're getting to this, we, we're not expecting you to be fed. We're expecting you to feed. You need to give others food. We're not asking you to, to, to be fed. We're asking you to feed. You're, you've stepped up. You've taken responsibility. And so we want to get there. So we as leaders need to be at a place where we can say, as Paul said, be imitators of me as I'm of Christ. I urge you to be imitators of me as I am of Christ. If the bigger church only had you left after this weekend, would their passion for Jesus increase? Would they lay their lives down for the lost the way Jesus did? Would they believe in spiritual family? If all they had was your life, everybody who's not with us, who's attending with us on a Sunday, if they only had you to look at, or will they walk with Jesus be just a mellow, more talk than doing? Will they have no desire for the people that Jesus died for? Will they have a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a, a stinking attitude towards church family? I am doing God a privilege by showing up to him. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a God a privilege by serving and ushering him, doing this and doing that. It's an attitude that says, God, I am here and it's a favor to everybody who's with me. If people only had you to look at, what would their lives look like? They only had you. All of us leave. So we can go one by one. Everybody leaves. Or on Monday or Sunday, let's say Sunday, people show up. They just had your life to look at. What would they become? We should take a look at our attitudes. There was a men's prayer meeting two weeks ago. Pastor Chris spoke about this. He says he spoke about our attitude towards the things of God. In the moment we have an attitude of it's a privilege to serve God, we're in a bad place. Because then you forgot that you were added to the church because of the grace of God. And you forgot that the fact that you can be here is not your choice. The fact that you can have spiritual family was never your choice. It was the grace of God. And so before my time runs out, um, I want us to look at, we have two responsibilities as leaders when it comes to the things that breaking a relational discipleship culture. One, we need to identify it in our lives and get rid of it. And two, we need to help the broader church to understand what we mean by relational discipleship culture. Okay, so if you don't understand it, the next person comes and asks you, if you don't share what we mean, we're building in a different direction. And so we need to know where we're at. God has called us for a specific call, and we want to fulfill that. Okay, so here's the first one. It's not on the screen, so you should listen. PowerPoint takes more time. So you got to listen. The first one is you only embrace the mission, vision, and values because you're associated with every nation. You embrace the mission, vision, and values merely because you say, I'm part of every nation. It's not who you are. And so see, the moment we do that, you would say, I make disciples because I'm part of every nation. I honor God because I'm associated with every nation. I love Christ-centered because that is who I'm part of. You see, our mission, vision, and values was not designed by someone around a table and thought, this will be great. It was gotten conviction from the scriptures that the primary thing for every man is to honor God. And so your life should move beyond saying, I'm part of a church and therefore we do this. No, I'm a Christian and therefore I do this. I wake up to honor God. I wake up to be Christ-centered. I wake up to be spirit-empowered. I wake up to be socially responsible. You should not care for the least fortunate because every nation asks you to do it. It's because of who you are. You would not want to see a transformed society because you're part of every nation. No. God wants to see a transformed society. Therefore, 
we want to do it. And so the moment we think like that, the moment that's in your mind, I'm only leading a connect group because of this name, every nation, and all they do around the world is having these small groups all over the city and no one knows what they do. You're ignorant if you think that's what's happening in our small group. There's great miracles happening. And so we, the first thing that breaks a discipleship relational culture is if you merely embrace it by association and you're not saying, I honor God because that's who I am. I make disciples because God what God wants me to do. I want to see a transformed society. I want to be Bible-based, spiritual, socially responsible because that's what God has called me to do. Okay, so secondly, what breaks a relational discipleship culture? The moment you think discipleship is a program, the moment you communicate, you think discipleship is something you enter and you exit. You think you graduate. You think it's something you come into and then you get out of, and that's for the immature. That's for the new believers. They get discipled. You're breaking relationships because you're not treating people in value. You're treating people through a production line. Now we're taking people through a system. The moment you think our growth path is a program, something you start, something you end, you have the wrong mindset. There's greater biblical uh, uh, foundations behind our growth path than merely saying get in and get out. There's much more to it. And so the moment we think discipleship is a program and not a lifestyle, we are crippling our relationships because you will treat people like that. You will handle them like all I need to get on Katrina is to discover spiritual. All I need to do is get them here. All I need, you are not even caring if she's getting a freedom or not. You're not caring if she's embracing who the church God is adding her to. You don't care about that. You care about my person got through. And then we make them graduate. And then, yeah, that's the end of it. Thirdly, what breaks a relational discipleship culture if you think discipleship is a ministry you choose to serve in. Something you sign up for and you sign out of when you're tired of it. If you can find that in the Bible, we'll add discipleship to our iSurf platform um, form on Sunday. There's no way you do that. The moment you do that, we're sitting in a danger because you'll treat it as something you can sign into and sign out of. You can never do that. Here's one thing the Lord will never tell you as a disciple of Jesus. I want you to not make disciples in this season of your life. God will never ask you. You will ask God, God, I am in a season of my life. Can I just be excused until we get through this? But God will never ask you to stop it. God will never ask you to help someone else look like him. Never. Because it's relational. And so the moment we think, no, discipleship, you, you fill a card and then I serve as a connect group. No, no, no. You're a connect group leader because you're a disciple of Jesus. And Jesus had small groups. And so we need to shift because the moment you speak like that, you're affecting the bigger church, which we are responsible to steward as leaders. The moment you treat it, you know what you like that? is ushering and hospitality. Those things you sign up for. And if you want to move from ushering to hospitality, just fill in another form and we move. But discipleship, you cannot do that because it's relational. You cannot escape it. It's your lifestyle in what we do. Then, fourthly, if you grew up, I don't know if this is just in a white culture, but we are the saying, do... Do what I say, but don't do what I do. Oh, it's the same. You know what? I, I've come to realize cultures are not that different as we think. We have many of the similar things. And you think, oh, well, that's, a, that's a black thing. No, that's not. We also had that. You know, and so one thing is that if we say, do what I, do what I say, don't do what I do, we as leaders can never do that. We can't go to our connects and go to... We can't tell people, you better make disciples, you better preach the gospel, and you don't do nothing. 
So the moment we do that, you, you are lacking. You are lacking in impartation. You can't give over heart. You can give over theory. Well, I believe the Bible says we should do that. But your life will never display that. You'll never influence. Because you yourself is not modeling it. And again, I want to remind you, and I'll remind you as I'm going, I'm speaking to leaders. You're expected. We're not asking. You're expected to lead relationally. You're expected to follow Jesus. You're expected to, to make this up. You're expected. If nobody actually should ask you, you know, nobody needs to do that. Why? Because it's expected. It should happen. You know, I, I, came, I came to Namibia in 2017 on a visitor's visa. Guess what I did during my visitor's, three month visitor's visa? I started a connect group. Why? Because wherever we go, we are called to reach people. So I'm not starting a connect because I wasn't even employed. I wasn't even sure if I'm making it into this country. I still had to follow the process. But why do we do that? Because I know in Ventuk, there's people who do not know the God I know. They need to know Him. And so we... We don't, we do what we do and we tell people to do what we do. So we ask them to imitate us. This one, I repeat this one, but you can only think what this one is. What breaks the relational discipleship culture is if we as leaders are not leading the negatives. Why? Because it's indication that you don't care about people or not with us. It's an indication that your time is not invested in helping people become like Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's, it's just evident. And the moment, you know why we struggle so relationally and then we cry out for care? It's because we are so inward focused. Inward focusedness doesn't mean we're relational. Like, when, when, like we need to get outward and ask God to help us in what we do. So we need to believe in small groups. It is what changes a city. Why? Because there's someone caring enough to spend their hour and a half a week with you. There's someone who says, I want to help you. I was telling Jojo this past uh, week with my connect. I was telling Jojo, Jojo, disconnect. And I want to tell you guys, Connect is on and off. I had many failures. Many. Many. I've stopped many connections, started other ones, asking God, this one, this one I'm going to do better. You know, and I have this one now on a Wednesday. And this one I'm going to do better. And I was telling Jojo, this one I'm going to even be more straightforward. And so we sat, we spoke about Lordship, and I said, guys, tell me, are you guys tied? I want to know if, where do you spend your money? And I want to know it by you. I'm not going to, don't write in your book, tell me. I want to hear with my ears if you're stewarding your money well. I don't want you just to write it and then you go with it and hope to God you're going to figure it out. No, no. I want to know because God has given me the leadership of this connect and I'm going to help them. And so we got to ask more. We want to help people all the more. Um, what breaks a relational discipleship culture is the last one I'll share. Now, I'm repeating some of the stuff, but it's not engaging, establishing, equipping, and empowering people. Why? The moment you engage, you say, I value someone you don't know. The moment you establish, you say, I, don't, I care for your life so much, I'm willing to give up my time to see you know the Lord. Equipping. I care so much when you come to heaven that you will not stand empty-handed, but you will be equipped for the work of ministry. You'll be fruitful. And one day when you stand before the King of Kings, you'll have crowns in your hand because I cared for your life. That's relational discipleship. Caring. I care for you and therefore I will help you. I will help you. I will care for you in doing that. So when we don't do that, when evangelism is not a, a lifestyle, when it's not, you know how you do know, you can even start, how many names do you pray about that's not people that know the Lord through a week? 
It's just it's it's a it's an indication where you can look at how inward focused you might be. Establishing. Establishing is not just getting someone to victory weekend. And even with victory weekend, we need to, you need to find out why on earth is every nation doing victory weekend from the Bible. Get some scriptures. There's so many scriptures on the freedom of the Christian life. Therefore, we want to get you to a training because we want to help your life. We want to set you up so that you can grow all the more. So these are things that break. And normally the common thread between these things are you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing. You just know what you need to do. And so you need to reverse and say, God, you need to help me. I need to know why. Why do we evangelize? Because Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. So I want to follow you as an example. Why do I establish? Because Jesus walked three years with his disciples to get them that we can be here today. Okay, and I want to help others to do that. When I die, there's a ripple effect. Same with equipping, the same with empowering. God, we need to have a biblical conviction from Scripture. Don't get it anywhere else. Don't get it from us. Get it from Scripture. Why it's important to invest in people. And, and, and in my connect, I was challenging the guys around spiritual family. Because I noticed how we treat it. Um, you know, if, if you only show up to this type of stuff, and only when you're required to serve, you have a privileged attitude about you. When you only come to church when you need to serve, and the rest of the Sundays, you're going to relax at home. You don't understand the privilege of being part of a spiritual family. You don't have the bigger picture in mind. You don't have it. Because like Pastor Chris, we are living stones added to the body. I don't know if you read the scripture. It says 2,000 were saved and they were. and No, sorry. 2,000 were saved and the Lord added. I don't know who added you. But the Lord adds. And the moment we are part of a family is because God has placed us together as a unit to lead. And we want to lead. So I'm going to try in my last three minutes to tell you how to build a healthy relational discipleship culture. Okay. Relationships are key. And, and, and you've got to learn your weakness. I have, I've grown close to a couple of people. And you know why we grow close? It's because we have fought a couple of times. <laughs> They've been mad with me a couple of times. I had my, my sister, Beauty, there. I have Caroline. Caroline is very regular. Me and Caroline argue regular. You know, disagree. No, 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 no. I don't see it like no, no, no. But it's moments later we come and we work through and say, yeah, sorry, man, that was me. Right. Help me, forgive me. Let's work through it again. You know, and we, we, we need to understand that building a healthy relationship culture does not get built by expecting someone else to do it. We need to build it. We need to take. The moment you always point to, you know, but, but if, if a Chris can just do it better. No, no, just do it. If the leadership can just do it better. No, we're all working it out. Just do it. Just make sure you're forgiving and repenting and forgiving and repenting and staying in humility and we keep building forward for God. Okay, and so what builds and what 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 role do we play as leaders when we build? One role we play, we need to live it. We need to model it. In everything that we do, we need to model it. And second is we need to guard it. We need to protect it. We were talking um you can have two things, both great ideas, but we need to protect what we do. We don't do everything. I like, uh, what, what's his name? Philip, the other Philip, not me, I'm referring to myself. Philip Pretorius always says, you don't go to McDonald's expecting steak. Why? Because that's not what McDonald's does. You don't come to every nation expecting something else. No, we make disciples, we raise leaders, and we plant churches. That is what we'll do. We'll try to get you to raise up, and wherever you get sent, 
you'll make a disciple and a church could be planned and you don't even need to lead it. Just start connect groups. We'll send someone. We have enough staff willing to come to the full-time ministry. So we need to live it and we need to guard it. And so there's a scripture that I want to read for us. I need to close. Let's go to the next one. Sorry. Let me just read it. Um, yeah. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others. This is a strange thing for my generation. To count others more. Because why? You're, you're a value yourself. Just first look into you and make sure you're okay. And you know, be you. No, no. Count others more worthy than yourself. Um, let each one of you look not to his own interests. I will serve when it's not conflicting with my interests. I will lead a connective. My schedule opens up. It's like, it shouldn't conflict. If it conflicts, no. And, but also to the interest of others. So don't only look to your interest, but also to the interest of others. So give me five minutes to just complete this. First thing is, how do we build a, a relation with discipleship culture? Lord, if you want to be relationally effective, make sure you always align to the King of Kings. Make sure you are in submission. You are submitting to God, meaning you're coming under the mission. God, is this contributing? Then I'll do it. If, it. if it's not, then I'm getting out. We need to be in lordship. The closer you will get to God, the more quiet you will become and more action will be in your life. The more you behold God, the less you will speak and the more you would want to do. Because you will behold who you're actually serving. And you will stop complaining, yes, so the songs were just not moving today. And this was not right, and that was not right, and I wish they could just give us not polystyrene cups, but this cups, and all of these things. And so we got to have lordship, meaning we are concerned about the purposes, the world, opinion of God before anything else in our lives. We value Christ in us. Secondly, is evangelism. Why is this building a relationship culture? Because it's relational to reach out to someone you don't know. It's relational to lay your life down to the world that Jesus laid his life down. Discipleship is relationship with God, relationship with the lost, relationship with fellow believers. So we need to value others in relationship. Preaching the gospel is not saying God loved you. Preaching the gospel is Christ crucified. Repent. For their salvation in Him. It's not just passing a Bible scripture. Great, do that. But get to the point where you're concerned about the soul and the eternity of that person. So use all your other methods. Take people for coffee. Eat lunch. Do what you want. But you're trusting for something more. Thirdly, we built a relational discipleship culture through discipleship. We value maturity in Christ. The greatest relational thing we can do is help someone else fulfill the greatest call in life, and that is to look like Jesus. And so we care immensely for someone if you're willing to help them to look like the one who made them because sin broke them. And la uh, second, lastly, is leadership. How do we build the relational discipleship culture? What is the church trying to do with us as leaders? You might not always feel it. But the aim is to get you to be all that you should be so that you can influence society. The church is trying to equip you to maturity, to be well-defined, to find your identity in Christ so that you can go into the world and make a difference. So that you can be so confident if you needed to start the biggest company in the Vindu, we would release you and say, do it, because we know you'll do it to the glory of God. We are that is a relational thing. And so here's, here's what your worst thing you could do. 
is if, if example, you are asked to pray after this and then you go like, no, 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 not me, not me. Why? Because you're not, you're not grasping an opportunity for God wants to do something. When someone draws you in, stop justifying. Stop pushing back. And start just quieting your mouth and do it. Because God would grow you through that process. God would develop you. The greatest growth you'll experience is when you start serving others. And the last thing that I'll close with, how do we build a relational discipleship culture? Is we value lasting relationships. It's if the person to your left and to your right, to the back and to the front, have full conviction, no matter what we go through, you will not leave. We don't believe in disposable relationships. We don't believe if you get offended, you should leave. And we're not leaving. We need to build as a family. We need to be a unit. If you're here, and you're perhaps not one of the ministry leaders, you should be serving. You should be serving in church. You should be serving somewhere. And when you're not serving, you should be attending. If you're a ministry leader, you're serving, and you're not leading a connect group, you should be leading a connect group. And if you're not leading a connect group, you should start leading one. Because it is how we build relationally. It is how we build relationally. And we are giving our best to build relationally. We were just speaking to Neil earlier. Um, we have these things called leadership groups. And just we're trying to grow more relationally in there. If you don't know what is that, it's probably because you're not leading a connect group. So you're not in one. It's where we care for you to grow you even more. Do you want more growth? Start leading. We're going to help you even more. And so these, three, uh, these five things... Because value dictates everything we do. Value, you know some of the things we call excuses and justifications? It's just actually misplaced for the word, you valued something else more than something else. It's, it's actually not an excuse. You just valued something else more. That's basically. Okay, so read your Bible, watch TV. The choice you make is the one you value. Simple. Go to connect or stay at home. The choice you make is not an excuse. Work. <laughs> Which one do you value? Everybody has a lot of work. Just go and do your connect and lead and serve in church. And then the last three in, in saying, not in, not in explanation, is prayer and sanctification and fellowship. So we need to pray for one another. We need to pray for the lost. We need to be concerned about the sanctification of people. What does sanctification mean? Meaning that people are becoming like Jesus. We should be deeply concerned. Paul says, this is the will of God. Your sanctification. You want to be in the will of God? Your sanctification. Get sanctified. How do you get sanctified? Don't do it on your own because you can't. You need people to help you. Because you're not that smart to see your blind spots. You need people to help you. I am what I am because of people who help me corrected me, who spoke to me, who ministered to me, who corrected me, who fought with me, and all the other things that I do. Amen. Lord, let's pray. Yes, Lord. Father, I want to thank you for this evening, God. Lord, that these are not just messages, Father, but you're moving this church into a direction, God, where we are rapidly going to advance your kingdom. God. Not loosening the strength of our nets in the local church, God. But the way, the, the, the way we are, the, the more we are strengthening down here in our leadership, God, the greater capacity we are building for the world that's not yet with us, God. And so help us to strengthen, to take arms, to become like a chain, like a net, God, to even grow more for you. Father, may you shift our hearts this evening where we don't value the things you value, God. You in us, the lost that's out there, the maturity of every person, the leadership, the godly influence we should have in the societies, Lord, and family. Lord, we are not a group of people, we are a family. God, we're not a, we're not a, a crowd or people just watching, we're a family. 
you've put us together to serve one another and to move in a specific direction. God, help us. Help us across all our churches to fulfill your call. And God, I even pray that you call those who should be going, Lord, who should be standing up and going to plant more churches. In the name of Jesus.